Welcome to Building Better Businesses, an ABA podcast. Learn firsthand from business owners who built successful ABA businesses. Utilize proven techniques and strategies to help your practice thrive. This is Building Better Businesses in ABA podcast with Jonathan Mueller. Amelie Grido is a BCBA and the founder, CEO of Galena Autism and Behavioral Services. She's a board member of the Council of Autism Service Providers and a founder and co-host of PodCasp. Nah, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Jonathan. Good to see you. It is great to see you. And I want to start with, um, can you tell me a little bit about your relationship with your brother growing up, kind of what your role was in his life and how that shaped you? Yes. So I was born and raised in Ghana, West Africa. And like many families who live in um, areas with few resources, my parents decided to go over to Europe and um, work and make a better life for all of us. So we were left in the care at that point of my aunt, who had just had a baby, my cousin, um, around the same age as my brother. My brother was six months old at that point. Um, hindsight now, I do understand that she had postpartum depression. Um, she couldn't get out of bed. She was very just on edge. Um, long story short, I ended up being responsible for raising my brother all the way through um, his college years. And now he's a beautiful human being and um, is so compassionate in many, many ways. And it's one of those people who every one of us in the family can count on for just support in, at any time. Um, but it was rough. It was rough growing up. He, I mean, there was a lot of abuse, some intentional, some just life being life um, to the point where he was more nourished to where his limbs could break off. It's a childhood disorder called kwashiorkor, um, where if you don't have enough nutrition, you can get very, your limbs will get snappy and it's so thin um, it, from just being starved on purpose. So um, it was a lot of stuff like that, but it helped. It was such a, a, it was a horrible thing to be in as a child, but also such a blessing because it, it really made me understand that there's nothing as there's nothing like comfort. Comfort is a state of mind. Um, and joy is also a state of mind and happiness is a state of mind. So no matter how crazy life gets and I'm going through a crazy phase of life right <laughs> now, um, I can sit back and say, I can get through this too. And it's a state of mind and I can find joy within mm -hmm. myself no matter what's going on around me. That's a powerful self-awareness, just that, that idea of like joy and happiness is a state of mind. But hang on, like, so you were four years old when you started taking care of your baby brother. And I, I mean, it like, what do they say? Our brains don't fully develop as adults until we're 25 years old. So this is extraordinary to me, but I, I wonder if, um, you know, in Ghana, it, we're bad enough here in this country, in the U.S., talking about mental health and postpartum dis depression. In Ghana, was, was there more of an openness and, and community and dialogue around that? No, in Ghana, you hide. <laughs> you hide those things. Um, so a lot of it was masked um, by, by the community of kind of sheltering her by, sh by like kind of hiding it behind closed doors. So when she couldn't wake up and do things, it's like, don't talk. If you don't talk about it, it's not happening kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the signs were there. People in the community, we are very community-based um, society. So even though I was living with my aunt, my grandma lived next door. My grand aunt was next door. I had uncles and aunts all within walking distance right around me. So we had a lot of love and support. Um, it was just so hidden that I had to bear the brunt of it. Um, because it's it's not something that anybody talked about. Mental health is definitely, um, in this country, is difficult enough, but around the world, um, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done. Well, if you could say one thing to your brother right now, what would it be now? That he's loved. He is loved. Um, it's easy to go through the kind of childhood we did and feel like you're a loner in the world. Um, 
and I've worked really hard to make sure he knows that he's loved and I hope he feels it. Mm, that's special. Well, I want to come back to you. You refer to this idea of community and community is something I'm really passionate about. And, um, and in fact, back in January, you did a CASP webinar, a CEU event on this concept of Ubuntu. Can you tell us more about that? Ubuntu is a principle out of South Africa, but it really reflects the general African culture. And especially in West Africa, where we are raised to do things in the interest of the community, not the individual. So, um, and COVID has been such a really good lesson in all of this, of what I do as Na Amele affects you, Jonathan, even though you're all the way on the other side of, of the United States, right? So the idea is that we are all shared in humanity. Um, we can't take ourselves that seriously because we all need food, we all need sleep, and we all do the biology stuff, right? Um, so if we can just look at ourselves as human and look at everybody else as human first, then we are more likely to be compassionate to each other and to keep each other's best interest in mind. Um, the other piece of that philosophy that I love so much and that I was raised on is we all need to bring our best to the table. So my best is not just for me, my talents, my gifts, um, my wealth, I'm not wealthy, but my money, whatever it is that I have, it's not for me as an individual. It's for me to give that best to the community. So if we can all bring our best and Jonathan, if you can bring your best, one of it being your, your super radio voice, right? <laughs> <laughs> and all your, all the culture, the company culture stuff that I've been learning from you. And thank you for that. If we can all speak into the world and into each other that way, we can all be better as humanity, as a community, and as individuals. Uh, it's simple and yet powerful and effective. And you know, one so I, one question I have for you is like, is there a shared definition of community? Do you think around the world? And and, and the way I think it, like, do different countries share um, uh, uh, a common sense of what it means to be a community and what those behaviors look like? And I think back to like when I studied abroad in Beijing back in the nineties. A community, there, there is a very palpable and different sense of obligation to society and obligation to one's family. And, um, and how does that manifest? You know, you might have a family where they, they live in this, um, you know, outside this hutong, this, an alley, and they, they, the grandparents live there, aunts and uncles, and, and they will, for example, keep that apartment in their area absolutely pristine, but anything just outside of it, hey, if there's trash there, that's not a big deal because it's outside of, mm -hmm. of those four walls. But I don't know, what's your sense? Is, is there a shared definition of community across different cultures? That's a good question <laughs> to ask. Um, I really think it, it, it's different. Um, and I've come to really love the individualism in the United States and community and family being just you, your spouse or your significant other. And if you have children, your children, right? Mm -hmm. In the United States, that seemed to be like kind of that community that speaks into everybody's life. Um, where in my culture, your community is literally the whole culture mm -hmm. because it, it's based off of your family name. So my family name, my maiden name is Tago. If you go to anywhere in Ghana and you say your last name, it immediately paints you exactly to a spot in Ghana. Mm. So if I say my name, you know I'm from Jamestown. You know who, and if I say Namile, especially, you know what my dad's name is. You know where my family is. You know what our history is. And you will know that we're a family of educators and med uh, medical people. So you, that name, because that name carries your whole identity you then walk through the world making sure that you are doing things that brings positivity to your family and your community i know that's super interesting because yeah we we certainly don't have that in in our country and there is this sort of like individualism above all um i think we've seen some of that through through the last couple of years of COVID. um but and COVID, um, COVID has taught us such a lesson about how problematic that framework is because something that happened many, many months ago in a town that I'd never heard of before COVID, right, has impacted me greatly, you greatly, and every single one of us in the world very, very much and continues to be an impact, right? I'm suffering 
I'm still suffering symptoms from that from that mm-hmm. impact. And yet it started in one place in one small community. Mm. And that is such a powerful visual mm. of Ubuntu to me of mm. how we all, one thing happens and it ripples. So whatever we describe as community, we need to always keep expanding on that, right? Because it, it what I do affects my immediate family. It affects my extended family. And then it keeps going. It affects my community in Bucks County. It affects my community in PA my, and all the different communities that I have. So I'm always, I always try to think of my decisions. You know how people have, what will Jesus do? I yeah. always think of what impacts would this have on my community? Mm. That's how I approach decisions. I like that lens. That's a, that's a, that's an insightful lens in thinking about our world. Well, I, it's, you're a member of the, of the cast board of directors um, and you were, you were elected about a year ago. Uh, why were you interested in joining the cast board and, and, and what is wild success as a cast board member look like to you? So cast is one of my communities that I'm very, very proud to be of and love so much. And you share that community with me, Jonathan. Um, I initially joined cast out of frustration. Um, so George Floyd happened in 2001 and, we all got the emails from Nike, from FUBU, from wherever you've ordered stuff before, right? Um, saying um, how they value diversity and that they are taking a stand with. And I, I saw the phrase, the black community time and time, and that even like triggered me even more because what what is the black community? We are a lot of communities within, within one. There's no one black community. We don't have one black meeting (laughs) hey what are we going to do as a community it's just a joke talking about what community should be defined as right um so we got i got that email and it just so happened that that afternoon laurie had just sent one for cast um i'm not sure if it was laurie i think it was because she responded um of how cast values diversity and stands with um with people of color and what happened with George Floyd and all that stuff. And I sent a long lengthy response that I had wanted to say to everybody else um, of thank you for your support, but let's talk about what that support looks like a little bit more. What does your board look like? What, uh, what have you done to make sure that that diversity that you're supportive of really does exist? And um, I so respect Laurie for this. And I, she's just the best in in so many ways um she was she sent a very kind email back almost right away saying thank you for bringing this up um you have very good points and it's something we want to improve on um and invited me to join cast i then became a member of cast and danny who's a member of the membership committee immediately reached out and asked for me to be part of that committee so we can work on improving diversity so when you talk about community bringing their best together, CASP as a community decided to, to create that space, right? And make sure that they are putting action behind, behind those words. And um, that's one of the many things that we do so well as a community as, at CASP. Mm-hmm. And this is Lori Udom, who's the executive director of uh, our CEO of CASP, but who is also a living legend in our field, having almost single-handedly passed um, uh, insurance reform laws. Um, uh, across all 50 states when she was with Autism Speaks. And then uh, uh, Dr. Danny Openden, also a cast board member and CEO of SARC. We had him on the pod uh, just a couple, a few months ago, which was neat. But, you know, so that's so, what I love now about what you did is you provided very direct feedback to Lori. And and it, this is one of the many things that I love about you. And <laughs> we've gotten to know each other really well over the last year is um, is how you give specific feedback. And I remember at a, a cast conference, you came up and actually gave me some really good feedback, like after immediately after my presentation. Like, w- is that something that, is that a skill that, that you feel like you're born with? Is that something that you had to shape and grow? It came out of necessity, I think. Um, because as a child, I'd had to advocate not just for myself, but for my sibling. And when when you've had to do that over and over, you just learn to ask for exactly what you want, because you might have just this much opportunity to get it in. Um, and I think it, life just shaped that out of me. And I try, I really, really try to do things for people that I'd like done to me. Um, mm-hmm. I'm a Christian. I, I, I'm a woman of faith. That's one of my identities. And 
I really do believe in if we can treat everybody the way we want to be treated. Um, and I, I fail at that so many times and have to remind myself, I, I think we are all better off as humans um, in that way. So I give the feedback I wish somebody would give me all the time. Mm. Powerful. You know what? You know what the imagery that comes to mind on this nah, is for me, it's almost like this iceberg of, of you know, you've got like 90% of an iceberg is below water. And as we think about our identity and our values, that's all stuff that exists like below the water, right? Below the surface. The 10% of us that exists, like our, our behaviors and then the results of those behaviors, I mean, that's the 10% above the water. And then and then you look at social media and that's a whole different lens of like, that's the you know, <laughs> 0.1% of what people see. And yet, and people generalize with a particular and we won't go down that like social media batch, you know, we could. <laughs> But it's, it's almost like, like, how do we help one another in our communities to like, to see past and, and try to see that humanity in others and our identity and values? Um, Cause it feels like that would make for a much closer tight knit world and community. If we took that time to do it, why doesn't that happen? And, and, and how do we make it happen? I, I think part of it is just an American cultural thing. And mm. that, that a piece of it is just humans, right? We all want to be comfortable and we all want to make sure we have what we need. And I think in, in doing that, we, we forget that we are dealing with other human beings to, to get to that. Um, so I'll give you a, a quick example to kind of give you a good picture of that and how I think about it. I was on my way to a, a, my first CAS board meeting and had to do a transfer in Minneapolis, I believe. Um, but my plane was delayed and I couldn't get a connecting flight. So I decided to catch the bus and they showed me where the bus stop is. And again, that's me tapping into community that I didn't even have, right? And asking for, hey, resources of how to get where I need to get. While I was waiting for the bus, I it really... A gentleman who was African American or looked African American was kind of stumbling, and he was he was tall and he was kind of like stumbling, looked off, headed my way. Um, I I worked in Philly and lived there for a while, so my Philly instincts was cross the street, get away from, and that's what unconsciously my brain has been wired to do. I yeah. I grew up in Ghana. And we are majority black society. We are almost an all black society. Um, so I didn't used to think that way, but somehow living in this culture for the last 20 years have shaped me to start thinking of if you see a black person and just from their, their skin color and their physique, if it's a black man to feel a sense of danger. So I crossed the street and I came right, I, I stopped and I'm like, whoa, what are you like? This is all in my head having a conversation with myself, um, I asked myself, what are you doing? Why? And then I couldn't answer the why, so I walked right back. And it, of course, making sure I'm safe, I looked around, made sure I'm in a, in, in a place where if anything happens, I could get help. But I walked over, and at that point, he had gotten closer to where I was. Um, and when he went past me, I decided to do a human thing and ask, how are you? And just from asking that question, he stopped, he looked at me, and I could tell there was pain. He, he wasn't drunk. He wasn't high. He was in pain. And um, he, he told me, oh, um, I don't know what hit me. I got my COVID vaccine yesterday, and I have to work today. So he was on his way to work at the airport where I had just left and had to show up to work. Couldn't take the day off because he doesn't have PTO, but was mandated to have his COVID shot. And we all had those COVID shots and we all know how it took us out for at least 24 hours. But you and I had the luxury of pausing and mm -hmm. lying on the floor till <laughs> we felt better. And he, he just couldn't. If he didn't show up to work, he would get fired um, because of staffing shortages that were happening already. So he's dragging himself literally to work to serve all of us at the airport while he was sick. And here I was, a human who knew nothing about him, judging him before I could even say a word to him. Through that interaction, he, I told him, hey, I, do you know that the COVID shots can make you feel sick? He wasn't aware. He's like, oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I told him, just hang tight. It's quick, but you do need to take some medicine. Have you taken any medicine to kind of alleviate some of the symptoms? He's like, oh, no. He was like just so frazzled by his pain. He couldn't think straight. 
So I had Tylenol in my in my bag and asked him, would you like some Tylenol? And he said, oh, I really appreciate it. I offered him some and he and I wished him the best. And he went on his way. All that took for me was literally a minute or two out of my day that I was waiting anyway. It, it, it cost me literally nothing to be human to another human being. And that whole situation could have been different if I followed my initial bias, right, to just cross the street. So to get back, to circle back to your question, I really think if we can all just stop and every time we have that uncomfortable feeling, um, we both love Brene Brown, so you can relate to this, to, um, to just be vulnerable and be okay with being uncomfortable and live in that and sit in that uncomfortableness and work through it instead of reacting right away from that, I think we'll all be better off. Mm. It costs me literally nothing to be a human being. That is so true and so powerful. And you know, I, I, I heard two really many amazing things about what you described in that story. But one is you stopped and you took the time to just ask the question, how are you? So basic, how are you? And two, you genuinely listen. <laughs> Right. You you like listened for intent and and what his feedback was. And you're a human being. Fuck now that's so like powerful. I'm like, I this is um how do we build those skills if we're not used to pausing to ask the question and to listen with intent? Like, how do we build those skills in ourselves? It it requires reflection because it's so we are so wired and being in ABA, we all know that we get conditioned, right? And we can all start autopiloting things. And being human can become an autopiloted thing. And our biases that are built in systemically can then just start directing us in ways that we don't realize um, what the impacts are. So I really think the easiest way for me that I that helped me work on this was to recognize when I start feeling like mm, I'm not too sure about this person every time I feel that I don't care what the situation is who it is that I'm dealing with it helps it, it becomes a stop sign for me of stop and and assess what's happening is it a real thing or is it because it's different or is it because that person is different um and it's it's been helpful to help me stop and even if even if the per the other person on the other side is doing something wrong, to really think, wow, what what is their learning history? What is their history of reinforcement that led them to that? Why is that telemarketer yelling on the phone? Like, why why are they so aggressive with me? Why is this person just nasty mm -hmm. on the outside? And understanding the part of the iceberg, using your analogy that I'm not seeing, what happened to them on their way to wherever they are? How was their morning? What is their, how, how did they grow up to shape them to that person? And um, it's helped me to, I'm not perfect, <laughs> but it's helped me to look at people a little more compassionately, even when things are not going too well. Yeah. I, it's, it's so easy these days, especially being on Zoom to just to say, oh, how are you? Almost more like a pleasantry than an I'm actually interested in how you're doing. Mm -hmm. And something someone shared with me um, a while ago is like, just add one little word to that, to change it, to, to then elicit a response and then listen. And that is like, how are you doing today? Mm -hmm. And I think, um, and I think just genuinely listening, I mean, look, and social media, like this is the classic example is like, are people taking time to listen or are people having one way microphone conversations or um, uh, bull, bullhorn conversations? <laughs> yeah, that's more like it. Yeah, but I just taking that time to, to, to reflect, um, which is important for any leader, right? Carve out reflection time and, and that notion of like, it's easy to be mindful, but it's hard to remember to be mindful. It feels powerful. Well, yes. I am. Um, you are. Um, you were the founder, nah, and uh, uh, um, and a co-host of the podcast. So full disclosure, <laughs> nah and I are, are, are co-hosts uh, along with uh, Natesh and, and Hallie and Judith. Um, and so I want to. Um, I tell me what got you interested in like podcasting, and what's your vision for the podcast? Um, it's another reflection of the beautiful community we have at CASP. And again, to Laurie's credit, building such a great community 
where it, she's created space for everyone. Um, so I always say I have my best reflections at 1 a.m. because that's when I'm <laughs> wrapping up to go to bed and had one of those thoughts of, wow, like we have no way to have dialogue and and debate some of the hard things in our field. That, that we don't have that platform and what better place to have that platform than CAS. So I literally, that same, it was literally the middle of the night. I shot Laurie an email saying, this is what I'm thinking. Let me know if it's something that's in planning or if what you think about it. By the next day, she had responded in true Laurie fashion. And um, she gave us the resources we needed and all the support we needed to make this happen. Um, so even though it was my idea, I really do believe that it would not be what it is without you, Natesh, Judith, Hallie, and um, all the other people who have been involved in supporting us, like Tim Curley taking time mm -hmm. out of his his day and his podcast to give us suggestions and ideas and best practices, right? It really took a whole community to make that happen. So yeah. that's how that became um, the podcast. <laughs> Well, I have so cherished uh, my podcast community and each of you all. And uh, man, it was so fun. Um, uh, actually, the CASP conference going out and <laughs> eating um, uh, meat butter. Oh, my gosh. Why am I blanking on the, the name? The marrow, bone marrow. Um, that the might bone. be a, of all of my favorite like nah moments is when you and I could like mutually enjoy <laughs> meat butter. Oh, it's so good. Yes. Yes, uh, yes, very yes. healthy too, I think. I, <laughs> um, yeah, I would like to think it's healthy. It was very yeah. delicious. <laughs> and I'm glad uh, that others didn't like it and we appreciated it <laughs> more for us. <laughs> ABA practice owners, are billing and insurance issues getting you down? Well, let me tell you, Element RCM is your answer. Element provides world-class revenue cycle management services, contracting, credentialing, authorizations, billing, and more. Element's your partner, so you can focus on what you love to do, providing the highest quality services to your families and clients. Element's a preferred partner of the Behavioral Health Center of Excellence, and its founders have nearly 20 years of experience owning and operating successful ABA organizations. They understand you. They know that every dollar counts, that integrity is everything. Element works with any practice management system. And Element's not a vendor, they're your partner. So find out more and take a free revenue cycle assessment at elementrcm.ai. So in addition to being a, a CASP board member and the founder of the podcast, you're the CEO of Galena Autism and Behavioral Services, GABS. So tell me, more about gabs and and honestly like how do you freaking find time to do all of this and be a mom <laughs> um yeah my my kids make life so full that it frees me up to do other things because they just they fill my bucket so much i have to share it um i have three amazing kids zekai is two years old daniel is five years old and yesenia is six and they are the funniest, coolest humans I've ever met. Um, they just bring so much joy to me. Um, so they sleep, they eat. Their kids is busy, but they they help. Them being good kids just help a lot. Um, I found Gabs in 2012 out of a need. It was not a choice. It wasn't something I set out to do. Um, to to answer the question about gaps, let me just track into how I got into the field of ABA. I was driving and praying for what to do next. Um, before I got into ABA, I was doing drug and alcohol therapy, working with inmates um, to complete drug pro a drug program to then get released on parole. Um, I knew I was missing the mark. I knew that wasn't quite where I needed to be. Um, and I saw a sign for the university, walked in the door, asked what programs you had. And they're like, oh, we have a new program. It's called ABA. Like, that sounds just right. <laughs> and that's how I got into ABA. Um, through, through my work with ABA, um, at that point, I lived in Philadelphia, which is an hour away from where I live now. But we still came here for church in Bucks, in Dollstown area, in Bucks County. Um, so then my cousin will call and say, hey, like, this 
this friend's daughter is not getting out of bed for school. Can you help them? This friend's daughter cannot sleep. Can you help them? And then at church, the past, I overheard the pastor's wife saying um, it, her daughter was 18 months at that point and she never slept through the night one day in 18 months. So they've never taken a vacation. And I just couldn't help but say, um, can I help? <laughs> like, can I help you? And she's like, uh, of course, like, of course I'll take that help. I talked her through some of the stuff she's doing and gave her just a few suggestions and some books to, um, and some just fam, um, parent resources to look at and made it clear that I've not explored any of that. But when it comes to ABA, here are some things she can try. She tried it, it worked in three days and she started preaching that to all the other moms <laughs> in church. Before I knew it, I was getting call after call after call. Oh, now my kid is not eating. My kid is not sleeping. And um, pretty much drove me into starting my own my own ABA business um, through my work with GAPS. And that's how GAPS, Galena Autism and Behavioral Services, was founded. Through my work with GAPS in the last year, I was consulting in schools a lot and helping really create programs to keep kids included mm -hmm. in school before it became a big problem for them to get sent out of district. Um, and I found that um, effective and successful. And then when I trained everybody and phased out, as with human nature, people go back to <laughs> to their old ways, right? Because everything is fixed. So mm -hmm. let's go back to what wasn't working that then reinforces the problem again um, and found that that was an effective way to help kids. So I um, I started GAPS Academy, which is my private ABA school um, licensed by the state of PA. Um, so GAPS Academy serves as an out-of-district out placement for mm -hmm. kids in Central Park School Districts and the surrounding school districts. And um, up until last year, most kids had to be bused 30 minutes plus outside of my community to get access to out of district placement. So I'm really excited and proud of the work we do. And um, my, I'm so passionate about making sure that what we're doing meets the need of our community mm -hmm. and not just something we are doing. Wow. It, it reminds me of the old adage, you know, when starting a new business, just serve that first customer extraordinarily well. They're going to tell others, then bring on the next, your next client or customer, serve them extraordinarily well and just keep going. Well, you're also like, you were, I mean, you didn't set out to be a business owner. You set out, right? You set out to like help a mom and this kiddo who hadn't been sleeping. And it reminds me of uh, the book, e The E-Myth Revisited, The Entrepreneurial Myth. Uh, I think it's by Michael Gerber, but it's this idea that we, we have this myth in our country that every, like, we're a country of entrepreneurs. And it's actually, no, that's not right at all. We are a country of behavior analysts who have this calling to start a business or hairdressers, right? Who are amazing hairdressers and they're going to start um, a, a business. And, um, and it, it just sort of reminds you that story and the importance, I think the spoiler alert from the E-Myth Revisited is like your, your organization, your business is as only as good as the systems and processes. Mm -hmm. um, and the culture that you put in place that allows it to live beyond just you as a person. But that's not something that's taught in schools. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I definitely didn't set up, set out to be an entrepreneur. Um, I had family members. My aunt is a pediatrician. She had her own clinics. And um, I've had other, fam like my dad had a printing press at some point in Ghana. So it was kind of in my blood, but I'd never been exposed to it growing mm. up so it wasn't anything that I set out to do but I'm really happy and and thankful for the opportunity to to serve in that way right, to serve that's why you're a servant leader at heart I love that now nah. well I remember you telling me at one point about very early on in your uh career in 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 behavioral health you worked with um gentlemen in prison who would run um you know who had run these huge uh how do I drug cartels, I don't know the right word, but can you tell, like, tell that story? Um, so yeah, that was part of my drug and alcohol therapy um, history before I got into ABA. And I bring a lot of those, val like, a lot of the lessons I learned there with me, because it really helps me think through when I'm working with that three, four, five year old, 
what are the things they need throughout life that mm. stand for early. Um, so very quick story to kind of give you an insight into, into that part of, of my history. I was working in drug and alcohol therapy. It's a program that they had, it's a step down program that has to be completed for my clients and my, uh, my patients to be eligible for parole. So we are talking about like the big drug dealers who you see mm. on TV, who had millions of dollars stashed in their basement, in their basement or under their, um, their hardwood floors. Those are the kind of clients that I had. They've been in jail for minimum eight years. Most of them are 10, 10 years plus. Um, so I had, I usually will, I love baking. Um, when I used to have a lot of time, I baked more. But even now, I still, I love baking with my kids now more. But I love, I would always bake cookies, cakes, little things and, and bring to work with me. So for birthdays, for each of my clients' birthdays, I'll always bake like cupcakes and I like, get small cake for to celebrate. Um, and this drug dealer who was now my patient um, had been like, he'd been in jail for, I want to say on and off 25 years plus. So he's, he's an older person and he's known as like a big drug dealer. So people always see him as a serious person and he, they don't see emotions from him. He walked in the room and we all yelled happy birthday and he broke down in tears and told me that was the first birthday he had celebrated outside of jail since he could remember having birthdays. Because since he was 12, he'd been in and out of jail, in and out. And I asked him, well, you're, he's really brilliant. He's so intelligent. I have so many good conversations with him and learned so, so much from him about the world. Um, and I asked him, I was like, you're so smart. Like you could literally get through a college degree like this. So what is the, what is the issue? And it came down to me assessing him, giving, giving him a quick assessment and found out he was dyslexic. And I took that time and started assessing all of my, my patients and over 90% of them were dyslexic. And what triggered me to run that assessment was hearing time after time. And when he said it, it clicked of, oh, my teacher always told me I was stupid. I hated school. Um, so I, I got kicked out of school or oh, I hated school. So I dropped out. And to think of this, he, he was in kindergarten when he was told he was stupid and he lost interest in school after that. So this is a, a six, five, six year old who, if he had gotten the help he needed, who knows what the trajectory will be. But as somebody who doesn't know the rest of his iceberg, right, I can sit on the back end, mm. you're a drug dealer, you deserve what you get and all that stuff. And there's plenty of accountability to be had in those situations. Sure. Um, but yeah, that, that, pro, that program taught me a whole, whole lot about what's going on and, and how systems really can, can make situations really, really bad for, for some people. Um, and that's like a whole, we can go on and on about prisons and what reforms need to happen there. Mm. But um, just understanding that these are human beings that I was dealing with and they had a story to tell too and taking the time to understand their story um, led me to understand that what I was doing was solving the problem too late. And that's really what drove my passion to working with children um, and working on early intervention to hopefully make sure that our, our patients and the families we're working with never get to the point where they feel like there's no out for them. So no child is, is called stupid. I, this is, uh, this is so interesting because I mean, to, to become a successful drug dealer um, and to manage a business, like a, a huge business like that. I mean, you're not stupid, right? Like you, really smart as you describe. And, but for him thinking that he was stupid because he was called stupid, mm -hmm. you know, his life could have gone in a totally different track. I, that Absolutely. blew me away now. And having the right resources, how mm -hmm. many times do, and I, I consult in school, so I see it when a child of, of BIPOC, which is black, indigenous, mm -hmm. um, just a, BIPOC is a, a catch all phrase mm -hmm. for people from, and I hate using the word minority community, but people from underserved communities, we, mm -hmm. we use the phrase BIPOC. So when a BIPOC child 
as an issue in school. Every time I get called in, nine out of 10 times, I know what the race of the child is by what the request is. What? So I get called in and they will say, this child need an assessment, <clears throat> a behavioral, as an assessment, it's not behavioral. Um, so can you please assess him? Because there's a learning disability going on of some sort. And I'll assess the child and then I'll get another request for an assessment, but that assessment is for behavioral management. And these are two kids who are exhibiting the same <laughs> problem behaviors, calling out in class, um, messing with other people's work because they don't want to do the work, hiding under the table because they don't want to do the work. So work refusal looks different for two different kids with two different races and get two different requests. One gets a learning evaluation, learning assessment request. The other one gets a behavioral management, which doesn't exist. We all know that, but a behavioral problem request. So we all know that systemically, we feel the system fills a lot of BIPOC children very, very early on because that then funnels you into what? if you're constantly the, the child who is getting assessed for behavior problems, instead of getting the support you need up front, it really shapes, it, it shapes your identity as, as a person. And we all grow up with that identity. So, so two kids with the same symptom, symptom, with the same presentation of behaviors of work refusal, and the white student gets the learning evaluation, the assessment. Never fails. And the the BIPOC, the the underserved, um, uh, you know, the African American student gets a behavior management plan. Why is that happening? It's all, it's so many layers to it. Most of it is systemic bias, um, and I can speak to it from the community I live in now, which is majority white community. It's just the other, right? It's the idea of that other. So if the other has a problem is because they are the problem. Where if if it's me or my child or somebody who looks like me, oh, something has to be wrong. We take more time to look into things when we feel connected to the issue. Mm -hmm. So I really think on the human level, that's that's what's going on. Then there's systemic, there's the whole systemic piece of it. And the, the data is there to, to prove, to show it. Kids, um, kids of color and BIPOC kids get, get restrained more often. They get more disciplinary um, issues. They get expelled more often. Um, I mean, you can go on and on. It's staggering across the board. Wow. And I mean, does the teacher even consciously know he or she is doing that? It's so ingrained and unconscious. That same thinking process that led me to think I'm supposed to cross the street is the same thinking process that we all go through. Um, and it's, it's, it's happening in the unconscious and we just need a, the way to, to use ABA terms, right? <laughs> the way to deal with a behavior is to, is to observe it. And because mm -hmm. it's happening in the background, we, we can't observe it. But what we can do is take account for our feelings and that feeling that we get of, oh, what is this child doing? Oh, what is that person doing? And the minute I feel that again is to put that pause and that stop sign and say, okay, why am I having this feeling about this child? Is it because of the problem or because it's a child who looks different? Hmm. Wow. And it, it layers on, on from there. I, I honestly think most of the time it's not out of malice. There are times when it is. Mm -hmm. I really think it's just that whole unconscious thing happening. Do you experience this too? Oh, personally? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. My my children experienced it. I I mentioned I have a five-year-old boy um, and a six-year-old girl um, who are in preschool now. Uh, my daughter is in kindergarten and will be in first grade. And last year I was in tears um, with my son. He came home and told me, mommy, the kid didn't want to play with me. I'm like, what do you mean? He was, like, he's so fun and such a social person. He's a mini na, um, like other kids just love him. He's, he's so helpful with the little kids. So I asked him what happened? Like, can you tell me what happened? And he told me the new kid told him he can't play with them because his skin looks dirty. This is, he was four. These are four-year-olds having these conversations. 
Um, and that's not the only incident. My daughter has been called names. He has been called um, not pleasant names too. And this is all little, little four, five-year-olds, six-year-olds we're talking about. So when I say this is a systemic issue, it, and I know this is not even isolated to me. I have friends and, um, and other colleagues who, who share stories with me. Um, so ra the racism and the racial bias piece it exists. It's not just a, um, a news clip or something that's happening in the news. I, I live it. I have parents who would refuse to, to literally speak to me initially because of my skin color till they realize I'm the one who has to help them with the IEP meeting. Oh. Yeah. It, you know, it's that, um, oh gosh, I forget the author's name, but that book, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, um, that I only read after George Floyd and um, it was um, what was so eye-opening for me on that is that it's not it's not good enough for me just to be um, you know say hey I'm I'm not a racist there, there's there's a level of being an anti-racist because otherwise like my experience I will never see like the things that you are seeing that happen to your mm -hmm. kiddos absolutely and I so appreciate you saying that um, just accepting that things are going wrong is not good enough. Um, until we can all, again, bring our best to this issue and bring our best to, especially when it comes to diversity and, um, mm. equity and inclusion and justice. It's not a black or white issue. It's a humanity issue. If we don't, if we don't find solutions to that, and I know that there's so many people, the color of autism, and you can go on and on, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. at this issue. It's not a black, like I said, it's not a black or white thing. It's a systemic thing that will continue to affect and plague all of us till we all deal with it. Um, look, at, look at our field in ABA, right? I mean, I don't have to say the numbers. Diversity is beyond lacking. You look at the RBT level, we've made a lot of improvements in the last two mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. but those improvements like stops there. You look at how many BCBAs, um, I believe it's under 15% of BCBAs who identify as other races other than white. Um, and then you go to the C-suite and it's even more dire. We're not even collecting data on that to know what it looks like. Um, but how does that affect us as a community? How, how, can, you, how can we serve children who, who are not white when we don't have that cultural piece to it? Mm -hmm. uh, why, uh, we, I mean, look at the prevalence and the rate of autism. Is it really only happening to white boys? No, it's happening to children across the board. Mm -hmm. What powerful value can we bring if we can have me walk into a Ghanaian home? Or even if it's a, a home of, of another race and culture, I've found a lot, a lot of impact and success with my, um, my families from, who are Asian and from India. Um, because I can relate to them culturally. There's some cultural pieces that are related. And mm. I had to educate my staff on, hey, uh, when mom is not speaking, it's not because mom is not intelligent. No, 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 no. She's actually more educated than dad. And she's a doctor, by the way. <laughs> my staff asked me, why does mom not say anything? Does she not speak English? Or like, is, is something wrong with her? I'm like, oh, no. There's nothing wrong. She's very articulate. She can speak English very, very well. She's not speaking because in her culture, the dad speaks for the family. And they're like, oh, well, that's not right. I'm like, that is right for them because that's their culture and that's their family. But how can we speak to all these little nuances that do affect treatment and affect outcomes? Because we are not good. they were not engaging mom at all because they thought mom could not speak for herself. Wow. When it's just a cultural piece that we don't understand, it is. That, that's I, that's so hard to hear. And and I think if there's anything that gives me hope about this is that generally people are not of malice. I mean, yes, there are spiteful people out there, but people not just need to learn. They just need to be educated. And I appreciate that. That's part of what, um, it, it, like a huge part of what you brought to that interaction to help your team understand that cultural difference. And I mean, we can go this this whole diversity diversity issue. It's it's so important um, because I've had I've had a staff tell me, oh, these kids are um, 
are being abused. And I asked, what does abuse mean? Of course, we need to take it seriously. And then she, she says, well, their fridge looks empty and, mm. and their house looks dirty. So I, I did, and this is a family I assessed myself. So I went back with the staff and I said, okay, yeah, the house is a mess because mom has three boys who are all under the age of four and dad works long hours to support the family. And the fridge is empty. There's nothing happening. I literally observed dad making chicken fingers from scratch. <laughs> like there, I rarely get to do that most days, right? These are not kids that are abused. They just don't have a lot. So their fridge is empty because dad had to downsize his business because it was failing. And they can't afford to stock up their fridge. And mom is can't afford a, a housekeeper to help her keep her house clean. So I asked the staff, now, how can we support this family? And she said, well, we can help teach the kids how to help around. And I said, well, now we are being helpful people to this family. We're actually bringing hope to them, hmm. judging them because they don't fit what we grew up, like that box, right? And that other, it keeps coming up with the other thing. Um, so I was able to hire a clinic company and the parents didn't know I was paying for it myself. And we got the house clean to help mom reset. And then my team worked with the kids on creating bins for their toys. And um, is, is it a perfect situation? No, but that's, that's what that family's reality is. And we don't take two seconds to stop and think these are human beings who are, like this family was struggling and we had the opportunity to, to bring hope to that struggle and speak into that struggle in a little way and we could have completely missed that mark if we went through judging them and trying to other them. Wow. So bring hope, not judgment mm -hmm. to those families we serve. Yes. Oh my gosh. And diversity is the key to really brighten the light, uh, shine the light on that hope because mm. if you're not diverse. You cannot serve diverse people. Mm -hmm. Wow. Is there a, a resource? And, and just to be clear, like the, a, a DEI and, and that education is a lifelong process. Absolutely. Um, a learning process and sometimes an unlearning process. So it's not like a one-off learning, but if there was a resource or a book or a training out there that you'd recommend ABA providers access, what would that be? Um, so I'll do a shout out to BABA. BABA is the Black Association mm -hmm. of Behavior Analysts. And there's also LABA. Um, for the Latin um, Association. And I believe there's a Pacific Islander one also. Mm. I'd say get involved with those groups. You don't have to be Black to join, ba to join BABA. You don't have to be Hispanic to join LABA. Join those groups, find out what works they're doing, how they're trying to drive outcomes for their communities, um, for, for their kids in, in those communities and, and work with them and partner with them and bring resources to, to that. Um, that's the the easiest starting point. It 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 costs very little <laughs> to be a partner in diversity and equity. Um, and I really believe when we're talking about diversity, we forget we forget about the justice piece of it. Mm. And um, the justice can seem like a political thing, but it's not about politics. It's about making sure that when you see something that don't look right, you you try to to learn and find out why, the why mm. of it. So it doesn't look right that this family eats this food and brings it and send it with their child. And when you warm it up, it doesn't smell. It, I love the smell, but it might not be the, night, the best smell for everyone else in the clinic, but that's their food, that's their culture. <laughs> and we need to learn to just be more accepting, right? So mm. all the, there's so many little, little, little opportunities we have on a day-to-day -day basis to, to lean into diversity and to lean into, into equality and, and inclusion and justice. Um, Shala is another great, great, great clinician doing a ton of good work as for organizations. So I'll speak to the providers um, in this situation. There are so many provider groups that provide diversity and inclusion training for providers. One of it is the diversity movement um, mm. and the color of autism also have a lot of good work going on. Um, so those are some, a few places to, to start. Uh, well, I'm gonna drop, make sure that those end up um, as links in the show notes. Um, well, 
Now, what is one thing that every ABA business owner should start doing and one thing they should stop doing? I will speak to stop doing first. We need to stop being so competitive and clawing each other out. I'm living through it right now and it's painful and it's ridiculous and it's wrong. Um, I have a new provider who came into my industry who is PE back. Um, there is there's so much value to PE firms and PE money in our industry, but, 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 because there are so many real guards in place, it's easy to abuse to abuse things, right? Um, so I have this provider moved in and have poached all of my staff except for one. Mm. Every staff I had between December and March has been completely poached to the same place oh <laughs> except God. for one staff. It looks like a win for them. And yes, they got a win. I mean, I'm, I'm rehiring, I'm retraining, and... I'll, I'll be fine. The way I look at it is I'm sending out more trained staff into the field. So I, <laughs> I'll take it as a win on my end too. But the effect of that is families that I had to put back on wait lists because mm -hmm. I didn't have the staff to replace them because we're going through a workforce crisis right now. Um, what, what is happening is kids who will have worse of outcomes than they would have, and that just dilutes our science and our field. So the big picture, while we are all trying to claw each other out, while companies are poaching this company and poaching that company, it Ubuntu comes back, right? Mm -hmm. It affects all of us because when this one company's kids are not doing well, what are the parents remembering? Mm -hmm. They're remembering, oh, my child tried ABA and it sucked. My, my child tried ABA and their customer service is horrible. My child tried ABA and they couldn't even serve my child. So we are all just hurting each other by being so freaking competitive. And I'm so com I'm competitive. I love competition. There's nothing. I love having more people in our market. I can't serve all the kids in Bucks County. There are a lot of other providers who are doing great work in Bucks County, like Neurability, like Potential Inc., like our mm -hmm. first children. Um, I have no issues with that. But as a field, we all need to take ownership and take just give ourselves that little moral um, baseline of saying, let's do this right because we are dealing with children. Hmm. We're dealing with children, adults, people who are already vulnerable and families who are already desperate and had to wait how many months to get on a wait mm -hmm. list, right? So let's come up with creative solutions instead of poaching each other, hmm. throwing each other out and being so competitive with each other. That's what I'd say we need to stop doing. And, and let's work as a community and, and work together to make ABA better for all mm. and create better training programs for every RBT to, to get more RBTs into the field, right? Mm -hmm. um, so based off of that, I have decided to start an RBT training program called the Ubuntu Autism Institute, um, mm. you and I. Um, and the idea of that is to create a platform where Anybody can get quality training and hopefully outsource it to, to the community so people don't have the need to still come to still staff. <laughs> That's all. Once again, you're you're just creating capacity for our field and building up our field. That's amazing, Nara. Absolutely. And um, one thing we can start doing, I say I'll speak as to my to myself 10 years ago. I say young BCBA starting a business for the first time with very little experience in business um, to start to start asking for more help and more resources. Hmm. Um, so Jonathan, you run Elements and you guys help with um, with billing, with AR and all those um, all those not fun things for me as a clinician. And I'm going to urge other clinicians in the field to start looking at your resources and start looking at what you can you can outsource to create capacity to do the stuff that you actually enjoy doing mm. well said operating at the highest and best use of our leadership um yeah for sure well now where can people find you and gabs online 
We are on social media, all the platforms, and you can find us at gapsautism.com. Mm. Well, are you ready for the hot take questions? Oh, yes, always. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now, you're on your deathbed. What's the one thing you want to be remembered for? That I was a compassionate person. Mm. Because I have come across a lot of compassionate people in my life who have just spent two seconds to be compassionate to me. And Jonathan, you're one of those people. Uh, when you found out I was going through a rough phase in life, your first question to me was, how can I help? Mm. And I really hope we can all start asking that question more of, instead of why are you doing this? What's wrong? Ask, what can I do? How can I help? Um, so I hope, I hope that I'm remembered to be a person of compassion because I think it's important. It is. What's your most important self-care practice? <laughs> Closing my bathroom door at least once a day, locking myself in there for 15 minutes minimum. <laughs> and I've taught all my kids, they know when mommy's door is closed, if it's not an emergency, do not come in. So of course it never fails. I'll get it and knock on the door. What is going on? Mommy, no, this is an emergency. <laughs> so what's the emergency well i'm thinking about doing something and I'm, i was like no that that doesn't count <laughs> a future emergency is not one right now <laughs> so i make sure at least 15 minutes a day i lock my bathroom door and just stay in there and sit with myself sit on the party spend an extra five minutes uh, and just breathe and reflect um i also love 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 getting ready in the morning to some good afro beats and mm. dancing and singing like nobody else is watching <laughs> <laughs> my gosh a for honesty nah i mean like that spoken like a true parent of <laughs> young children uh well hey that leads into what is your favorite song my favorite song is afro beats um mm. jonathan i think i exposed you to that um not too long ago. I love Afrobeats is a mix of West African sounds. Um, I'm from Ghana, again, West Africa, and our traditional sound is called High Life. Um, and Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Togo also have similar sounds. It's a lot of drums, a lot of rhythm. Um, I, I just I just love it. It makes me feel close to home. And it, it's got a groove. So if you hear Afrobeats, you can help but, but kind of start moving and and shaking your booty a little bit. <laughs> it definitely has a groove. It makes you want to dance and be happy and like it, it experience shared humanity. It, it, I'm going to drop some uh, uh, some links to 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 your favorites and, and things you've recommended to me because it yeah. is just it is powerful. It's happy music. Yes, good artists to start with. Davido, he's pretty mainstream. There's mm. Fireboy. There's Wizkid. You can't go wrong. Just Pull up um, Afro beats on Spotify and and groove on. <laughs> I love it. Well, if you could give your 18 year old self one piece of advice, what would it be? That's a good one. I've not thought about that in a long time. Everything will be fine. Just mm. breathe. Mm. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Everything always. It, it, and do you know what? The things that don't work out the way I want it to are actually the best. Mm -hmm. And it, and to sit in, in being uncomfortable, it's okay to be uncomfortable. Um, I'm human. We are all human. And when things are uncomfortable, we are quick to try and fix it. We are quick to try and get rid of the uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, I found a lot of value. And I, I really think it's because of how I grew up. I found a lot of value in sitting in discomfort nowadays and learning from it and letting it soak, <laughs> soak in. And I've, I, I've come out of the other side better off usually. So. Wow. That is so powerful. It's um, idea of just like being, it's like mindfulness, being present with it and sitting in that discomfort yes. um, and not judging it. Mm -hmm. oh, such deep wisdom. Nah. All right. Well, you can only wear one style of footwear. What would it be? Nothing. <laughs> I'm currently barefooted. <laughs> I always kick my shoes off. Um, you'll find me in my office barefooted till I have to step out and 
and get on the floor or work with the kid or something. But yeah, I love being barefooted. So I'd go with nothing on any day. Awesome. Now, thank you so much for um, being in my community and being my friend and colleague. Um, I have loved our conversation. Oh, same here. It's always a great time, Jonathan. And thanks for doing this important work of getting more positive light out about our community, about ABA. Thank you. Thank you, Na. Thanks for listening to Building Better Businesses in ABA podcast. Stay tuned for our next exciting episode. In the meantime, please like, subscribe, share, and comment. We value your feedback. Don't forget to follow us on social media at elementrcm.ai.